Ready in church, so great to be with all of you this weekend. Want to give a special shout out to any of you that are watching online or any watch parties. But those of you that have made it here to the Richland campus tonight, shout out to you. My name is Stephan Davis. If we haven't met yet, I pastor the Portage campus with my wife, Candice. And big shout out to her. She just led morning prayer at 8 a.m. on Friday. Can we give a shout out to her? She did an awesome job. She's an incredible, incredible pastor's wife. And, uh, but I have to, before we go any further, give the biggest shout out right now to all of you that are at the Portage campus, those of you that are watching right now, and those that may be at home. We love you. We're so excited to be with you this weekend. And also wanted to let you know that Pastor Lee and Jane just sent out some correspondence this week via email that they have just started their sabbatical, and maybe you read that. But I just wanted to real quick celebrate them because they have done such a phenomenal job really since February. I don't know exactly how many weeks it is, but I'm pretty sure it was about 16 or 17 straight weeks of preaching through a pandemic into racial tensions and issues that have been happening in our country. And so it's just an incredible thing to have Pastor Lee and Jane as our senior leaders. And for me, it is just a huge honor to be a part of what's happening here, to move here, to be a part of the Portage Campus, but tonight to preach, to bring the Word of God. And Pastor Lee has set the standard high, if you know what I mean. And so I'm thankful for him and his leadership and just a huge honor. I'm humbled to be with you tonight. If we can, I want to just pray for Pastor Lee and Jane. If you would, let's just pray for them real quick. We'll pray as we open the scriptures and we'll dive in. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we're so thankful for what you have done in Pastor Lee and Jane. We just surround them right now with our prayers. We thank you for them, for their leadership. God, everything that you've put on the inside of them, we just bless them. God, we thank them that you would pour out blessing and favor upon them. God, in this season, that they would drink quickly and often from that well of refreshing, and they would come back rejuvenated and refreshed with clear vision for what's ahead. God, we thank you for them. And right now, as we open the scriptures, would you illuminate our eyes and our ears to what you're saying and what you're doing in each one of us? Would our hearts be strangely warmed by the word of God today? Amen. Well, if you would, you can open up to James 1. Because Pastor Lee last week started a brand new series called Revolutionary Faith out of the book of James. And I want to recap real quick what he spoke of in week one. It was the testing of our faith. And what he said was this, is Christianity is a revolution of the soul. Our greatest enemy is within, it's not without. And that there's a tug of war that's taking place between the testing and the temptation. Testing, it pulls on your faith, temptation on the flesh, but testing is meant to perfect you. So in week two here, we're going to continue our study of the revolutionary faith. And in James 1, and starting in verse 13, they'll have it up for you. It says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I want you to take a note of that, by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So this tug of war that's taking place that I spoke of, that Pastor Lee used that analogy. And really what we're asking for is Jesus Come over to my side, my side, the tension of faith, and would you grab the rope? I'll humble myself, you grab the rope, and when you pull, we become victorious. So how do we decipher between a temptation and a test? This is so important for us as believers is to know and discern. So I'm gonna message this, I'm gonna title this message as the momentum of desire. The momentum of desire. God has a lot to say in scripture about temptation. God can't be tested. Why? Because he is perfect and he is holy. It also says that we can't 
test God. So there's some parameters about what will be temptation. And it also says each person, literally every, you're not getting out of this one. You will be tempted. And it also gives one other qualifier. It says when. It doesn't say if, but when. So we know that God's given us an alert. He says there will be temptation. John 16, Jesus says, you will have tribulation. I kind of view it like a chess game. There's a, a thing about it when you sit down is you have to quickly start figuring out who your opponent is. What are they about? What are their demeanors? Some of that poker face is taking place at this chess game. My wife always is complaining that I play slow, methodical, which is so funny because everything else in my life, I'm like trigger puller. But in the game of chess, I really want to be measured in every move that I make. So what motivates your opponent? How is it that they're playing? And what about chess? There's different advantages and disadvantages to every piece that's on the board. So here it is. We're going to start out in understanding what is this process of temptation Number one, the enemy sets his game plan of temptation. Well, what creates temptation? We just read it. James says, by your desire. It's actually your desire that will create the opportunity of temptation. July 4th, last weekend, hanging out at the lake with some of the worship leaders. And I make that point because I'm trying to be as cool as them. And we're hanging out by the lake. And you have to know, I grew up in Phoenix, if you didn't know that about me, until I was 17, then moved to Colorado. That's literally the antithesis of Michigan. There is no water. And so I'm learning a lot, and I'm learning that in water is fish. And I would love to learn how to fish, but I never got trained in fishing. So if anyone wants to teach me, and you're not weird, I will go with you. That's a big part of it. But these worship leaders were talking about some different baits that they were using. And one of them, they started talking about a rat bait. And I was like, okay, that's gross. Um, and why would you use that? And why would you need that? And I'm sure it's just a little lure or something. Well, Pastor Caleb walks around the corner with literally this. If you can see that. I don't know if the camera can see that. It's literally ginormous. And it's disgusting, and it has everything that you would expect from a rat. But what was it in engineered to do? What, why was it created? It was meant to have all the look of something real, right? You can look at it. It looks like a rat. There's some other things attached to it. But what is the goal? The goal is for the fisherman to catch the fish, when he's going to set a game plan, he's going to pick the right bait. He's going to get the right line, the right rod. He's going to have it all figured out. And he's got to locate the fish that he wants. It's got to be a fish big enough to put that inside of its mouth. And so there's a game plan that that fisherman is setting. And in this analogy, the worship leader is not the enemy. So if you were wondering about that. But what is it about that fish that's so important? The fish has a desire and a yearning inside of it. It's motivated pretty much by one thing, hunger. Its desire, its, desire, its motivation is it's hungry. So what is it going to do? It's going to position itself in a place where it's going to capture the food. And so it's going to go over by the dock or the shore. And it's going to set itself up. And the fisherman knows this. And so he's going to cast the line in such a way to mimic the rat falling into the water or from the shore. Now, I learned all of this from them. I don't know this myself. Well, there's actually another story in Scripture that tells us more about how this all works. Because the enemy, he identifies the desires of the human heart. He knows. He's a student of the human heart. He's paying attention to your actions, your behaviors, what you're doing, how you respond to things. And there's a story from Adam and Eve. It's begin, the very beginning of Scripture. 
in the garden. And it actually says in Genesis 3, 6, that there is a desire. And it says this, the tree was to be desired to make one wise. This was Eve's desire, was wisdom. So in her heart, the desire within her heart, it was implanted into her heart to have wisdom. But what does the enemy do? The enemy is going to set the trap. Scripture says the enemy is crafty. The enemy comes to Eve while she is alone. Just like the fish was alone in the water next to the dock, the enemy comes, he's crafty. He finds her when she's alone. And he says this in Genesis 3, 1. Did God actually say? There's the lure. There it is. You just saw the lure. It was just cast into the water. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Free tip. The enemy exaggerates. Did you see that? Any tree? What the enemy came to do was say, oh, so... You can't eat from anything. It actually positioned Eve in this conversation on the defensive and actually had to speak up for the Lord and say, no, 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 that's not what God said. God said, I can eat from any tree, just not one. So you see, there's just free tip for you, alert, that there's an exaggeration in your thought life and the way that you perceive or the way that you're thinking, that is the enemy because he's taking what was the word of God and he's, he's, he's shifting it. So the trap is set because the lure has been cast. Same thing on a chessboard. Sometimes as a player to force the opponent to make a decision, you, you'll put them in check. You'll force them to actually respond and make a decision. And maybe a decision that they didn't at first want to make. And James said that lured and enticed by what again? Your own Desire. So Genesis 3, 4, the serpent says to Eve, you'll not die, you will be like God. So he lures and entices on the desire in Eve's heart. Genesis 3, 6, it was even in a tangible way, delighted her eyes. The way that the tree and the fruit looked, it actually delighted her eyes. So what happens? Many of you probably already know the story. But this is the point. An unsubmitted selfish desire bites the bait. Eve took the bite of the apple, Genesis 3, 6. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband. The fish of the bait, the fish, it bit the bait. Just like Eve bit the fruit, the apple. The fisherman, all he needs, the enemy, all he needs is for us to lunge and take the bite. So the hook of sin is set. And now shame breeds. It's the hook of sin. See what happens when this, when the fish was looking at this rat. He wasn't paying attention and all of the chaos of it falling into the water. The water bubbles that were taking place. But what was the fish looking for? It looked exactly like the rat that he wanted to eat. It had every element. The way that it shaped, the way that it fell in the water, the way that it tried to scurry away, this was designed to mimic exactly that. But what the fish can't see is what's on the very bottom that most of you have actually been paying attention to is these massive hooks. I actually got hooked on it right as the service was starting. So I know that it's sharp. It's extra sharp. I actually, there's like barbs and different things on it. See, the fisherman knows that if he can just get the fish to bite, not even down deeply, that fish is going to not walk away unscathed. It's going to be impacted by that hook. See, when we give in to the temptation of the de desires of flesh, we shortcut God and ourselves. See, the desire in Eve's heart, there was nothing inherently wrong about the desire for wisdom. But the enemy knew it and wanted to take advantage of it. Shame breeds in James 1.15. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. 
Once a seed of desire now has come to full maturity. What happened in the story, Genesis 3, 7? Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. All that the enemy had to do was just seed that, that seed doubt into Eve's mind and into her heart. And all she had to say is, yes, I want wisdom. But ultimately what took place is she decided on the shortcut and it opened her eyes just as the Lord said it would and just as the enemy said that it would because she ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what that allowed her to realize is that she and her husband were now naked and there was shame. And they went and they hid. The DNA in that seed that conceived that desire of the flesh was genetically coded for death. That is where it was headed. See, shame, it keeps the cycle of death on repeat. If you're on Spotify or Apple Music and you can click and click again and it repeats the same song and it just keeps the cycle going over and over and over and over again. Galatians 6, 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. I've heard shame defined like this. Intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Candace and I, three years ago, moved here from, Mich uh, from Colorado to Michigan. And this summer, July, three years ago, right after we had launched the Portage Campus, she came to me and said, hey, I think now is the time that the Lord is calling me to start my master's degree in counseling. And I'm like, really? That's awesome. Uh, and you have to understand, we just came here to launch a church, and I was like, all right, this must be God, because I wouldn't have anticipated this would be the timing of it. And now we are here three years later, and she's finished her program in mental health counseling. Big shout out to her. She's done amazing. But over the last three years in her education, we would sit and talk, and constantly where we would end up is the impact that shame has had on so many people. And her and I, we're in the people business. I'm a pastor. She's a pastor's wife with me. And she's doing sessions with people and counseling. And really, some of these people, it's the very, very first time they've ever said anything that's actually ever happened to them. And the result of those circumstances, experiences, or situations, the outcome for most everybody has been an element of shame. So what is it about shame? It's so destructful. It preys right on the human heart. It isolates. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about in a room alone and away from people. I'm actually talking about even the way that you think and the way that you'll position yourself around other people that think just like you. So it isolates you. It impacts your identity. It begins to define you, right? We spoke about it when we were reading earlier in the scripture where it says that there's like a form of godliness, but shame is not your truth. It's just being spoken over you. It's actually a narrative that's being said over and over and you just start to buy into it. You start to believe in it. It warps your view of yourself. So how did they get here? How did Eve get to this place? How do we get to this place in our own life? When shame comes in, and it talked about in James that there's a maturation process. Well, in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, in verse 1, it says this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, check. Lovers of money, check. Boastful, check, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, 
treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Check, 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 check. These are the last days. See, I imagine these people saying, I never purposed to this outcome. I didn't want to end up here. I never wanted to, to know of myself as being abusive, ungrateful, slanderous, or conceited. I never wanted to be defined as a lover of self, right? Because the greatest commandment actually says to love others. The defining aspect of the greatest commandment is that to love yourself, but it's the ultimate outcome is to love other people. So shame, ultimately, when it matures, you begin to define yourself by those things. You didn't just arrive there. It was the process. It was the desire. It was the lure and the enticement. And then you acted upon it. It was the flesh. It was the temptation. It was the tug of war that was taking place within you. This is true for all of us. It's true for me. It's true for you. Moments in my life where the enemy was coming and preying on the actual desire of my flesh, and I responded in sin. I responded by the way, by giving in to that temptation. Eve, she took that bait of opportunity. She took that shortcut. And it produced that shame because now, instead of walking with the Lord in proximity, she went and she hid. And this maturity of that sin in her life, the consequence ultimately was being removed from the garden, which was the proximity to the Father. And this set into motion the necessity of redemption and the ultimate need of a Savior. So, Jesus, He is the vaccine to the flesh. Where the flesh rises up, Jesus comes in. Let's talk about it. Was Jesus actually tempted? Yes, the answer is yes. Jesus was tempted actually three times. He was led to the desert, into the wilderness, and he was tempted. It's important to know that because he took on flesh. Just like James said, all of us will be tempted. Jesus just like us taking on flesh, he himself was tempted. He's also referred to in scripture as the second Adam. But we know there will be a different outcome. Let's read through it real quickly. Matthew verse, in chapter four, verse three. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So what does Jesus do? The very beginning, he identifies who the enemy is. He's the tempter. He is the tempter. When you're processing those temptations that are coming at you, deciphering who it is that's coming, who the opponent is, who the enemy is, and Jesus calls him out, you're the tempter. And what does the enemy offer him? He offers him bread. I don't know about you, but through the pandemic, I had the opportunity, due to my wife's baking, to put on the quarantine 15 because of the bread opportunity that was my, at my house, and I think she felt like it was a good thing to bake it like every other day, and so I ate it every other day. But Jesus, I think sometimes we think perfect Jesus being tempted, was it really a temptation? Well, it says right before that that he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So yes, the answer is yes, it was a real temptation. He had flesh, he had a stomach, just like you and I did. And he was tempted with bread. Lord, help us. But how did he respond? Verse four, he answered, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written. It's not hearsay. It's not a story. It is the written word of God. Jesus overcame the tempter because his spirit's desire was to fulfill scripture, not to go and eat that bread that the enemy was tempting him with, but to follow every good thing that the father was leading him to do. Let's jump into the second temptation in verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. 
For it is written, this is the enemy quoting this. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. See, the enemy now anted up and he's quoting scripture to Jesus to tempt him with the own word of God. Do you see it? How will you decipher in these last days what is a temptation? Because the tempter is crafty and he will tempt you with the very word of God. Where you think you're protected by only being tempted by bread, we know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy and he'll use whatever means possible to do so. He'll, he'll put out any bait possible to take you down and he'll actually use scripture to do it. Because ultimately, Jesus came oftentimes, how many times was it said in the New Testament that what Jesus did fulfilled this scripture? Jesus said this to fulfill this scripture. And what was the enemy trying to do? Lure him in with the scripture. Jump. That's what he said. The angels, they'll save you. Prove it. Prove that you're the son of God. No, that's not how Jesus responds. Jesus says, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, Jesus doesn't test the Father. And James said, God cannot be tested. Third temptation, Matthew 4. The de devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. The third temptation is directly associated with Jesus's ultimate mission of reconciling all people, all people unto himself. What was the enemy trying to give him? Give him the kingdoms. At first, it doesn't seem like, why would God want those kingdoms? Because that's why Jesus came to the earth. He wants to reconcile all people, all tongues, all nations unto himself. Every tongue and every knee, we will confess and we will bow. So this is something that he knows that it's in the heart of Jesus. The enemy knows it. So how does Jesus respond? Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. I want to read to you later on in James in chapter 1, verse 21. It says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The implanted word, the word, it was with God. It was in Jesus. And every temptation that came at him, he responded with the implanted word of God. But what does it require of us? It's meekness. There's a humility to receive his word into our hearts, into the soil. Give him permission. God, you can plant the seeds of scripture. You can plant your word in my heart. It's all yours. I give it to you. So the vaccine of the desires of your flesh, it's found in Jesus. And we receive his word with meekness. I actually want to share something with you that the Lord spoke to me. It was at, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I was asking the Lord, what's taking place? What is happening? And he led me to Amos in chapter 7. Amos is a prophet to Israel and he's speaking directly to the injustices that were taking place at that time. As I was studying and reading, I felt like it was an appropriate book to be reading from. And I felt like the Lord specifically highlighted in a really powerful way for me. Amos 7, verse 7, it says, This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line. With a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, in the midst of... Behold, then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. Well, I'm a pastor. I don't know much about construction. I don't know about you. You might be super handy. You might have that ability that was given to you. I don't. And so I had to even really look up and study what a plumb line was. And because of that, I actually bought one because I wanted to show you. I, I felt like if I didn't know, I wanted you to know. So here's a plumb line. It's really cool. 
You're like, what is this? It's a little hook at the top and a string and a weight at the bottom. The point of the plumb line in construction terms, see, I was really wise and thought that everything's called level. Everything. Well, I came to find out everything that's vertical, perfect, straight up and down is called plumb. You already knew this. You're smarter than I am. So here's the plumb line. And the plumb line was engineered to determine that this is plumb. Not from my vantage point and not from your vantage point and not from another vantage point of something else on the wall, but this actually determines plumb. Well, what determines the plumb? Well, it's the hook, so it has something to rest on. It has the string and it has this weight. It's a couple pounds. This is steel, brass, I don't know what metal it is, but it's heavy. When God's saying, I'm establishing a plumb line, he's saying, I'm putting my spirit the line, and I'm putting my word, the weight, into your hearts. I'm putting my spirit and I'm putting my word into your hearts. This is the plumb line. It's his spirit. See, if you just had the, the string without the weight, it would wave, it would waver, it would move. If you just had the weight, it would only be laying on the ground due to gravity, right? You're with me, you're smart. So this is the plumb line. It's the two in tandem, spirit and truth, word and spirit. This is the implanted word of God. And we receive this plumb line. We receive this plumb line into our hearts and we give permission to the Lord. This is truth. Truth is determined by the Lord and he gives it to us. This is how we will discern what is a test, and what is a temptation. There's one thing that I wanted to also talk to you about because there's a crazy thing as we were talking about these temptations. Both stories, do you know what preceded both of them? It was a voice from heaven. See, in Genesis 2, God actually spoke to Adam and Eve and he gave them clear instruction he said to them, you can eat of any tree, right? We've already talked about this, except the one. And what does our flesh do? Oh, I can't have the one. I can have any, but not the one. Well, that's the one that I want. Amen. It's so gracious of the Lord to give us his voice before the temptation comes because it's the plumb line. This is the plumb line. He said, this is what you will base everything from. When the temptation comes, it's the plumb line. It's my voice. Eat of any tree. That's the plumb line. We were in the car the other day, and seven-year-old daughter, Kaya, she's amazing. She's much smarter than me, much more creative than me. She's an incredible person. If you ever have the opportunity to meet her, and we're all sitting in the car, my three-year-old, four-year-old Bryn, and we're talking, Candace and I, and Kaya frequently, as kids do, interrupts, hey, Dad, what does God's voice sound like? And we're just on the highway. I don't know where we are. And I was like shocked, like, wow, that's a pretty intense question. And you interrupted me, and you want to know what God's voice is? All right. Well, there's a couple places I know that God's voice was spoken, and Kaya, I love your question. That's an incredible question. I don't think at seven I was asking what God's voice sounds like, so I love that about her. She's processing it while we're just driving in the car. I gave her the instance of baptism that God actually spoke over Jesus. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And there's a couple other dynamics, and she goes, no, Dad. I want to know what Jesus' voice sounds like. I just had to sit for a second and think, wow, that's an incredible thought to think about what Jesus' voice sounds like. We know the voice of our dad, our mom, our brother, our sister, but to think about what Jesus' voice sounds like. I'm so excited for that moment to hear his voice. And we started to talk about the still small voice, the whisper, how we commune with the Lord. But I want to go to that story real quick because in the story where we're talking about the temptation, there's actually the, the word then. In chapter four of Matthew, it says, then Jesus was led to the wilderness. Well, what was the story right before it? It was the baptism. 
And I love this about scripture. And it says here, Matthew 3, 17, behold, a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I'm studying this a little bit, and this isn't just a term of endearment or intimacy. This is actually God is affirming the kingship of Jesus. He's actually saying, this is my beloved. Beloved in scripture is the same word that David used for his son Solomon. So when he's saying beloved, he's actually saying, this is Solomon who is the heir to my throne. So God's saying, this is Jesus, beloved. He's the heir to my throne. And it's the first time in scripture, it's the first, not sorry, it's not the first time in scripture, it's the first time there had ever been a reality that Jesus was the son of God. Up until that point, until the baptism, it was not known that Jesus was the son of God. And God is saying with his booming voice from heaven, this is my son, he has the heir to my throne. He's the heir. And this is so important to us because we are co-heirs, we are co-laborers, we are wrapped up in the identity of God. And this is important too because he says that you're an overcomer. If you're a son and your identity is being formed in son sonship, then you yourself are an overcomer because in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, it says, We destroy every argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So we're co-heirs. Jesus is the Son. Jesus says in Scripture, especially in the New Testament when he's preaching to the disciples and teaching them, he's saying, you also are counted with me, just as I am to the Father. We are in unity. You are a son to the Father, just as I am a son. So you are counted son. You are counted daughter in the kingdom of heaven. And we destroy every opinion of ourselves, and we align ourselves to the plumb line. We align ourselves to his word and to his spirit. But we have to do it in humility. In Hebrews 5, it says this, he was a son that learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We want to be obedient. We want not the desires of our flesh. We want them replaced by his desires. That when we abide in him, that when we seek him, his desires become ours. Oftentimes, there's the scripture that says, God's going to fulfill all of my desires. No, when you're with God, when you know God, his desires become your desires. He puts them on the inside of you, the plumb line. His desires become yours. Church, I just feel like this weekend, we have the opportunity to overcome. We have the opportunity to overcome shame, overcome destructful thoughts, overcome the temptation of the enemy, overcome the desires of our flesh, and say, God, I need you. In this moment, I need you. So we just respond right now to the Lord and say, God, we need you in this time. Shame has locked you up. Maybe there's been decisions in your past where you haven't had the opportunity to say, I need healing over the shame that's happened in my life. Maybe you haven't yet found that person in your life to actually talk with. Find somebody who has the ability, who actually can express empathy to you, somebody that you can connect with, somebody that can hold you accountable. There's confession. And I believe that God right now, he wants to give us that overcoming spirit because take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. You have the ability to overcome the enemy. You have the ability to overcome shame. You have the ability to overcome temptation. So if we can right now, I just want us to stand and I wanna give us the opportunity right now to pray, to seek the Lord right now because I, I believe very clearly that God's doing this one specific thing in each one of us. I think oftentimes shame can be like a fog. It can be like a cloud. It can 
not allow us to see the horizon that Pastor Lee talked about, the joy set before us. It's, it's above us, it's ahead of us, and we can't see it because we're clouded with the shame that's taken us over. It's difficult to see what is ahead and what's through that cloud, and we have the opportunity right now to overcome that fog, overcome those clouds. Caleb and Rachel actually wrote a song about the cloud dissipating and light radiating. And I just want to pray that we have this opportunity, we have this ability through the power of God, through his word, through his spirit, through the plumb line of the Lord being implanted in our hearts to say, God, we need you in this hour. We want to be those over overcomers that you've called us to be. If you would, you can go ahead wherever you're at. If you're at home, if you're watching online, if you're watching at Portage, if you would, just close your eyes and we're going to respond here. God, we need you in this hour. God, we thank you for who you are, that you overcame. You are the great overcomer. And God, wherever we're at in our life, where there's been issues of temptation, where there's been the lure and the enticement, where there's been our flesh that has responded, those desires, God, we submit all of those things in obedience to you, obedience to your word, obedience to your scripture. And right now, for any of us that have had shame or you're in a cycle of shame, we break that in the name of Jesus. God has given you the ability through his spirit and through his word to declare that you are free, that you have overcome. You never have, no longer have to be in bondage or in a jail cell of the shame that's locked you up. It's freedom that has come to set you free. It's Jesus. He has come to set us free. So I just pray that over each one of you, that he's come to set you free in this hour.